Welcome to American Revolution and the Pattern of War. This is Melinda Cole Klein. To the British American colonists from 1763, the tightening of imperial rule, such as creating taxes and enforcement of the collection of trade duties, appeared both as a betrayal because of their wartime sacrifices and it challenged their beliefs about the rights of the English people to rule based on consent. Gradually, some colonists interpreted the new policies as a conspiracy to undermine their economy. All the while, Parliament desired from all their colonies, not just the 13 mainland colonies in America, to contribute paying down the national debt accumulated from monies borrowed to win the Seven Years' War. From the 1760s and into the 1770s, the colonists developed ever more creative forms of resisting imperial tax demands and regulations. By the time the first shots were fired at Lexington and Concord, British colonists to the king and British colonial patriots had come to view each other as two different societies. Their differences, which came to seem irreconcilable, pushed them headlong into a war. The outbreak of war and the political efforts of zealous writers such as Thomas Paine inspired many reluctant Americans to contemplate the benefits of independence from Britain. By 1776, many Americans, about 40 to 45 percent of the general population, thought that war with Britain was necessary and just, but the poorly trained Continental Army lacked sufficient resources to fight the strongest army and navy in the world, the British. Meanwhile, about 30% of the population was against the idea of revolting and 25% wanted no part in the political debate. Therefore, they were indifferent to it. George Washington and Nathaniel Green, brilliant leaders, were critical to colonial success. They understood the dynamics of fighting and winning a colonial war. The war put the Republican ideals of revolution to a severe test. Physical and economic hardships experienced by both soldiers and civilians led many to examine or reconsider their ideals and to collect in their own self-interest in regards to acting or not. It is important to remember that with the development of American political resistance, the colonists moved towards rebellion, thus outwardly resisting the imperial authority of Britain. This involved the key aspects listed here, why some discontented British colonists would move towards rebellion. The improvised war. These were battles before the official start of the American Revolution. Lexington and Concord fought from April 1775 into July 1776, at which nine days after the Declaration of Independence was published, the British Navy fired on New York. At this point, the war became official. The British win at Lexington and the American win at Concord. The war for independence began in Massachusetts. These early scuffles served as an education for many young patriots in fighting for their own cause. For officers, they had gained their military experience in fighting the French and Indians during the Seven Years' War though many were veterans of this war in particular. 
While British policies of 1774 with the coercive acts targeted political policies, economic interests, and independent attitude of Bostonians in particular, by December 1774, Benjamin Franklin was publicly humiliated as the fall guy for the publication in June of the personal letters of Thomas Hutchison. In these letters, the royal governor implied that the colonists needed to be reined in, that their rights needed to be curbed, and suggested an abridgment of their rights needed to be instituted. After the letters were published, Hutchison resigned as the former governor of Massachusetts. Benjamin Franklin was blamed for the scandal as he had passed the letters on to be published. Following the Hutchison resignation, the British government appointed a military man, General Thomas Gage, as the governor of Massachusetts in March of 1775. Because of his orders aimed to disarm colonists stockpiling weapons and artillery, Gage set into motion armed rebellion. This colonial reaction and what would follow were considered acts of treason. Gage sent his 700 soldiers to Lexington and on to Concord into the countryside knowing the colonists were armed and determined to protect their property. Gage had 4,000 troops against 6,000 to 8,000 militia colonial forces. Gage was greatly outnumbered. After the initial battles in Massachusetts, the Continental Congress petitioned the king that these battles would stop. These battles in particular were isolated incidents, and this did not mean all the colonies wanted war or to separate from the British Empire. But the king and his government would hear none of it believing colonial actions spoke louder than their words of loyalty and membership in the empire. Meeting in 1774, the First Continental Congress respectfully positioned for the colonists' rights as Englishmen without success. Delegates to the 1775 Second Continental Congress included more radical elements. I've listed here on this slide a chain of events, first with the Continental Congress meeting between September 5th and October 26th. At the First Continental Congress, two accomplishments that are historically significant include the following. First would be the Articles of Confederation, which created an alliance between the colonies and efforts to boycott the importation and selling of British goods. And secondly, that no exports to Britain of colonial goods until the intolerable acts were repealed would be the accepted procedure. The intolerable acts were also remembered as the coercive acts. The Second Continental Congress meeting in 1775 would be moving towards a complete break with England. At the beginning of summer of 1776, they appointed a committee to draft a formal declaration of their independence. And on July 2nd, 1776, it was adopted as a resolution, quote, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved." End of quote. Two days later, on July 4th, the Congress approved the Declaration of Independence. 
This document was written mostly by Thomas Jefferson. 33 years old at the time, a Virginia planter and statesman. And with the help of Ben Franklin and John Adams, this document would come to express concepts that had been circulating at the time throughout the colonies. Declaration drafted up and down the coast, appearing in pamphlets and newspapers and at town meetings. Jefferson borrowed heavily from their text. He wrote the Declaration of Independence, drafted in only two weeks. The final document was in two parts. In the first, the Declaration restated the familiar contract theory of John Locke, the theory that governments were formed to protect its citizens. The English Constitution promised colonists that they would be entitled to life, liberty, and property, which would be protected. Jefferson modified this promise, as he called it, quote, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, end of quote. Happiness was a relatively new expectation at this time. Happiness did not equate individual freedom. Then and now, this happiness, in the political sense, was found in the home. This happiness included a self-sustaining family structure with a husband, wife, and children, supported through their own economic endeavors. This moral and economic building block was the body politic. In other words, the foundation of society possessing certain rights and privileges. Under the political argument of the role of government by John Locke, the reason for government was to offer protection to its citizenry from foreign and domestic aggression. With the protection by this government, private property, material goods, and private persons are protected under the law. In the second part of the Declaration of Independence, it lists the 27 alleged crimes by King George III and his government as they violated their contract with the colonists, thus had forfeited all claims to their loyalty. Thomas Jefferson, the great legal mind that he was and gifted writer, became a patriot, an early factional party member because Jefferson thought outside the box and was very persuasive and influential. Jefferson was chosen to draft the Declaration of Independence because of his unmatched intellect. His version professed independence and the drafting committee headed by Ben Franklin required Jefferson to alter the Declaration to such a degree it angered him throughout his life. Jefferson approved of John Galloway's proposed Dominion status. Unfortunately, these ideals were about 150 years before their time. This would be the direction Canada would take in the 19th century when negotiating independence from the British Empire. Throughout his life, Jefferson's primary concerns were the freedoms of the individual. He believed in the equality of man, not absolute equality because individuals differed in their talents and abilities, but equal in their natural rights. Jefferson devoted the rest of his life to public service and upholding these rights and freedoms he fought for. He served as Virginia's governor during the Revolution, as the minister to France after Ben Franklin, as Secretary of State on Washington's cabinet, and as third president of the United States. His tombstone is simple and it reads as follows. Here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, 
of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom and father of the University of Virginia. While the number of British American patriots, as they were called, were a minority of the population, printed solutions began to persuade others to join in on the cause. By 1775, the patriot cause was gaining greater support among artisans and laborers who had hoped to gain from independence. Many British colonial discontents in Philadelphia became patriots for religious reasons and some well-educated persons questioned the idea of monarchy altogether. In January 1776, Thomas Paine anonymously published Common Sense, a call for independence and republicanism. The pamphlet aroused the general public and quickly turned thousands of Americans against British rule. While Thomas Paine's pamphlet was not popular among intellectuals, its message was clear. Reject the arbitrary powers of king and parliament and create independent republican states. I've listed here on this slide the path to declaring independence from the British Empire and then, of course, the war that would commence. So that this is a bit of a chronology, 1775, 76, into July of 1776, and then the American Revolution officially commenced in July 1776 and its consequences. By September 11, 1776, it's important to remember the British requested a meeting from the Continental Congress and their representatives to end hostilities, but the war would continue. For a little bit more historical background, I would like you to consider the following. The final phase of the battles of Lexington and Concord took an interesting twist, and this would be in the direction of the North. Washington and the Continental Congress made the decision to take Quebec and the St. Lawrence Seaway from the British. They erroneously assumed that the tens of thousands of French Canadians would gladly join the 13 colonies in rebellion. This was a mistake. Washington lost 5,000 soldiers in this attempt to take possession of British Canada. His ill-trained men deserted others and died of disease. Once war commenced in the New York Harbor and Washington's forces failed at the Battle of Brooklyn, the war could have ended here. However, British resolutions were unacceptable to the congressional representatives that met General Howe on Staten Island. This meeting, as listed here, was held on September 11, 1776, in history as the Staten Island Peace Conference. General Howe demanded the Declaration of Independence rescinded. Representatives Benjamin Franklin and John Adams refused. Battles and hostilities continued until the British loss at Yorktown, Virginia in 1781. Few observers thought that the Patriot rebels stood a chance of defeating the British. Reasons included the following. Number one, the British had more soldiers and money to fight this colonial war. Number two, few Indians supported the rebels. They were opposed to the expansion of white colonial settlement since the start of Jamestown. And number three, the Americans were militarily weak. General William Howe and his British troops landed outside New York City in July 1776, just as the Continental Congress was declaring independence in Philadelphia. Outgunned and outmanned, the colonial army retreated across the Hudson River. 
Washington's infamous crossing of the Delaware, to New Jersey, then across the Delaware River to Philadelphia. The British halted their campaign for winter months, which allowed the Continental Army a few minor triumphs and Congress to return from Boston to Philadelphia. British General Howe's military strategy was one of winning the surrender of opposing forces rather than destroying them. This tactic failed to nip the revolution in the bud. General Washington's strategy was to draw the British away from the seacoast, extending their lines of supply and draining their morale. The Continental Army drew most of its recruits from the lower ranks of society, the majority of whom fought for a bonus of cash and land rather than patriotism. Given all these handicaps, Washington was fortunate to have escaped an overwhelming defeat in the first year of war. Victory at Saratoga To finance the war, the British Ministry increased the land tax and prepared to mount a major campaign in 1777. The primary British goal, the isolation of New England, was to be achieved with the help of a small force of Iroquois Indians. British General Howe wanted to attack Philadelphia to end the rebellion and force surrender of the Continental Army. But Washington withdrew his troops from Philadelphia and was determined to continue fighting after the winter of 1777 in Valley Forge. This was where the Continental Army held up for the winter. A major victory for the Continental Army was fought by the efforts of General Horatio Gates and his men at Saratoga, New York. The American victory was a turning point in the war and virtually assured success combined with military alliance with France. By 1778, France had become an ally of the Patriots. They hoped to recoup their losses from the Seven Years' War. The French offered the Patriots economic aid and military assistance. Once the French entered the war after the Saratoga win in 1777, this began a chain of events favoring Patriot win in this war. In the two years to follow, the Spanish government offered monetary aid in 1779 and the Dutch also in 1780. By 1777, this war illustrated that the British were no longer the only mighty force on the ocean. Naval support came from the French, though the rough weather wreaked havoc at times that favored the British. What were the French aims with the alliance? Number one, territorial acquisition. The French government was very eager to reclaim lost West Indian Sugar Islands from battling the British during the Seven Years' War. Number two, in their best interests, the French government and monarchy recognized colonial independence. Number three, not only did the French government under Louis XVI offer naval support and troops, but training for the Continental Army, along with their Prussian allies. In addition, supplies, weapons, money, and a hope so badly needed for a win. However, the Crown borrowed substantial sums from Dutch bankers, and after the war, unable to pay their loans, this feature would, by 1788, bankrupt the French crown. Number four, although France and America were unlikely partners in this war, the French were intent on avenging their loss of Canada to Britain, and also, upon learning of the American victory at Saratoga, 
the French ministry sought a formal alliance with the Continental Congress. What did the Spanish and Dutch provide as allies, and what did they want in return? The Spanish aided the Patriots, but only with money, not with soldiers or officers or equipment. The Spanish were not sure about the Patriots and saw them as a threat to their empire in North America. The Dutch came in as allies to the Americans as well. This would leave England with no major European ally to back them in this war. Number three, the Spanish fought the English in hopes to regain their colonies of Gibraltar and Majorca, lost to them in 1704 to the British in the War of Spanish Succession. While the French and Spanish did not invade England, the Spanish did recover Majorca in 1782 with the help of the French. For the Dutch, trade concessions were desires and won as a part of the peace negotiations that would result by 1783. On land, the war moved west and south. By 1778, the British had retreated in the north to New York City. On the frontier, the war was fought in the backcountry woods and forested areas. At the outbreak of the war, Native American groups supported the efforts of the British because they were promised they would get their lands back if the British won. American Indians saw this as a dispute between two brothers. Native American tribes attempted to form a Pan-American alliance to strengthen their political position against the land-hungry colonists. With the French, Dutch, and Spanish pitted against the British in the American Revolution, this meant conflicts took place around the world. Wherever territorial positions were to be protected by the British, as her adversaries were eager to claim sovereignty over colonial territories. So the British Army and Navy, not only in North America, but around the world, were fighting a war on many fronts. King George III, sadly, went mad after the American Revolution. He had ruled from 1760 to his death in 1820. The British were fighting a war in North America, the Caribbean, and the Indian Ocean. With the prospect of retaining their big money producing sugar islands in the West Indies, lacking European backing, and the inability to rout out Washington, the British would be hard pressed to come out a winner in North America. But their efforts remained keen to retaining possession of their colonial island possessions. More evidence. Similar to the Seven Years' War, Parliament had to make a decision to get really aggressive or lose all their colonial possessions. So by 1780, the British government sent more soldiers to fight worldwide. They built new ships, but the war was transformed by then. They were losing. On the high seas, the French were showing the world that the British were not the only one sea power. Tactics by George Washington. By the time snow fell in late 1776, the Redcoats wintered in comfort in Philadelphia. Washington troops nearly starved and froze to death at Valley Forge during the winter of 1777. By February and March, they were in training again, refining their skills in the art of war. One of the greatest tactics of George Washington was to avoid major battles with the French by changing locations frequently. He offered his men confidence and success in fighting the British by taking them on smaller battles, and also this gave his men experience. I'd like you to consider the following question. 
did the British get tired of chasing George Washington around now that they were spread so thin fighting wars against the French, the Dutch, the Patriots, and also the Spanish around the world by 1778. This was a factor, but British military history and philosophies of the time advocated to stick at it while other leaders would give up. This is a tenacious character, which is very British. By 1778, the nature of war, with the arrival of the French Navy and Army, changed the face of the war. But Washington's frequent troop movements made it impossible to capture the commander. Because most Southerners were loyal to the monarchy, the British began a new strategy to rally the Loyalists in the South, supporting the British Army with supplies, information, and troops. Historians agree about 40 to 50 percent of the British American population were loyalists, not patriots, a violent and outspoken minority. With Washington stationed outside of New York, fighting in the Southern Army fell to his commanders, and it would be in the South, specifically in Virginia, that the last stage of the war would be fought. Here at Yorktown, Virginia, the British troops under General Cornwallis had nowhere to run. The French fleet was in the harbor. The British were surrounded. The year was 1781. While the fighting continued for six more months, this decisive battle ended the war. Wartime economy. While they had borrowed heavily from their allies, the Patriots lacked the ability to tax its citizens under the terms of the Articles of Confederation. Congress then chose to print about $200 million by 1779. Demands were high for medical supplies, clothing, food, and soldiers' wages. But by 1779, the paper money was worthless. Food prices soared to an estimated increase of about 80%. This was massive inflation. Because the French government was keen on reclaiming West Indian sugar islands, this is where their forces were concentrated. The British strategy was to recapture the rich tobacco and rice growing middle and southern colonies and to take advantage of the racial divisions in plantation colonies. By the end of 1779 and into 1780, the British under Cornwallis took control of Georgia and South Carolina. Washington's commanding officer in the South was General Gates. By 1780, there was a new army in America, the Southern Army. From 1778 to 1780, the British had retained control of most of the colonies. In North Carolina, the colonial army had retreated. In the summer of 1780, General Gates is remembered as heralding one of the worst defeats in U.S. military history. The Battle of Camden in which the war favored British General Cornwallis to make his final move. Afterwards, Cornwallis headed north to Virginia to take Washington's Continentals. But the British Army was stretched thin all over the southern and coastal colonies with Cornwallis leaving. General Nathaniel Green, replacing Gates, proceeded to wear down the British in a series of battles and skirmishes in thick woodland areas while General Cornwallis continued on to Virginia. Ultimately abandoned by the British Navy and surrounded by the French Navy and Washington's Continental Army, this was the end for the British forces in North America. And as mentioned by October, 1781,
Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown. With only 17,000 men, the American and French troops completed the war for independence. After the Battle of Yorktown, British and American representatives convened for peace negotiations. While King George III did not recognize the Battle of Yorktown as the final defeat for six months, in time the British government declared the war was over. What remained was to recall the troops, see to the transportation of loyalists from America, and finalizing the peace treaty. It took two years of negotiation to hammer out a treaty for American former colonies to be recognized by the British government as a sovereign nation, to decide on paying back war debt, and the drawing of new territorial boundaries. However, trade rights and concessions were incomplete. This feature would ultimately be a part of the Jay Treaty of 1795. The Treaty of Paris 1783 extended U.S. boundary lines to the Mississippi River to the west along the 31st parallel between the United States and British Canada and the Americans secured rich fishing grounds off the coast of Newfoundland. The treaty was good for the Americans but their allies were not happy for the investment and sacrifices they had made, including the French, Spanish, and the Dutch. The French allies were disappointed because the money lent to the Patriots would not be paid back. By the end of the American Revolution, France was essentially bankrupt. Native Americans, who for the most part fought as allies of the British, were left with no hope of reclaiming lost lands. But for the American colonists, the monarchy was cast off and the 13 colonies were independent of their British sovereign. With this treaty, the British government legally recognized independence of its seaboard North American colonies and relinquished claims to lands south of the Great Lakes.